Tonight at 10, the main search for survivors of yesterday's earthquake in Afghanistan is over. More than a thousand people are thought to have been killed, many trapped beneath mud homes in a remote part of Afghanistan. The people here didn't have much to begin with, but they've seen their homes, their possessions. You can see them scattered amongst the debris and their loved ones disappear in a single terrible moment. We'll have more from the scene also tonight as rail workers walk out on the second day of strikes. More travel disruption looms. Hundreds of British Airways staff at Heathrow vote for strike action, putting summer holidays at risk. Ukraine, along with Moldova, are approved as official candidates to join the European Union. We'll ask how long it could take. Waiting to count the votes. Now the polls have closed. This is Wakefield, one of two by-elections today. Can the Conservatives hold on or are they facing double defeat? And the extraordinary lasting impact on children from one of Scotland's most deprived estates who took part in this concert a decade ago. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, a wicket on test debut for Jamie Overton. But England's final test against New Zealand is delicately poised as the tourists fight back late on. Good evening. Taliban officials in Afghanistan say the main search for survivors from Wednesday's devastating earthquake in the southeast of the country has ended. More than a thousand people are thought to have been killed in the remote part of the country, including many children among the victims. Relief efforts have been hampered by the destruction of already poor road and communication networks in Paktika province, the worst hit area. Entire villages have been destroyed, with survivors saying they're finding it difficult to bury their dead. Our Afghanistan correspondent Sekunda Kamani is there and has sent this report. Homes reduced to rubble, lives reduced to memories. These were my son's shoes, says Agarjan. His three young children were killed in the earthquake as they slept, as well as his two wives. And when the roof fell down, what did you do? I ran towards my family, but everything was under the rubble, even my shovel, so I couldn't do anything. I shouted to my cousins, but when we took my family out, they were already dead. It's a three-hour drive to the nearest big city from the worst affected villages along largely dirt roads. Here, practically every home is destroyed, every family grieving. The people here didn't have much to begin with, but they've seen their homes, their possessions. You can see them scattered amongst the debris and their loved ones disappear in a single terrible moment. In this one home, 18 people were killed. Habib Gul raced back across the border from Pakistan to help bury 20 of his family members. If the world looks on us like brothers and helps us, we will stay here on our land. If they don't, we will leave this place where we have spent so long with tears in our eyes. The Taliban have been flying in aid on helicopters. The search and rescue effort has now finished. The most pressing need is shelter. Families forced to live in tents, flanked by the remnants of homes they worked so hard to construct. Have they become your responsibility? You have... Khalid Jan is now responsible for his five grandchildren. Two of his sons and his daughter were killed in the earthquake. All my son's children have been left to me and I'm all they have left. The house and everything here has been destroyed. I'll never be able to rebuild it. Aid agencies are delivering supplies, but this is a major crisis. Here, prayers for the nearly 50 people killed in one tiny village alone. Prayers needed too for those who have survived. Sikanda Kamani, BBC News, Paktika Province. 
Well, there are almost 40 million people in Afghanistan. The UN Refugee Agency says 24 million of them need vital humanitarian aid, and that was before the earthquake. $4.5 billion, that's how much the UN says it needs for this year alone to help the people of Afghanistan. But the question is how it gets to the people who need it most and not into the hands of the Taliban who took control last year and who have struggled to get funds because of their hardline Islamist policies. Our Southeast Asia correspondent Yogita Limay is in the Afghan capital of Kabul and the Taliban have appealed for international support but there is concern particularly about sending funds directly to them. That's right. Afghanistan doesn't have an internationally recognized government. And so a lot of things you'd see happening on the ground in this region if a disaster were to strike the country, which is uh, a number of foreign rescue teams coming in and actually helping with relief operations on the ground. That's something that's not happening. As far as giving aid money directly to the Taliban is concerned, there are challenges because there are sanctions against the group. And there are also uh, many who would argue about how can you give money to the Taliban under any circumstances until they deliver on their commitment commitments on women's rights and human rights. Uh, but equally, there are many who would point to Western accountability in this country. It is foreign funds that came in here until the Taliban takeover that propped up this country's economy and without them uh, it spiraled into a severe humanitarian crisis. Uh, either way, on the ground it is humanitarian agencies which are forming that important bridge to deliver international funds and aid to the civilians here in Afghanistan. Uh, the UK has said that they're talking to their partners in the UN and the World Food Programme, as has America. Uh, the EU has offered initial emergency support of uh, 1 million euros, that's roughly 870,000 pounds uh, and India and Pakistan have both said they're delivering relief material on the ground. Yogi Telemai in Kabul, thank you. Hundreds of British Airways workers, mostly check-in staff at Heathrow Airport, have voted to go on strike over pay. The exact dates will be announced over the coming days, but are they expected to be during July and August? Today, workers on the railways in England, Scotland and Wales walked out for the second time this week, with just one in five trains running and another strike planned for Saturday. Here's our transport correspondent, Katie Austin. Demand for travel has taken off since COVID rules eased, but there's already been disruption amid aviation staff shortages. Now, hundreds of British Airways workers at Heathrow Airport, most of them check-in staff, have voted to walk out on dates yet to be confirmed. The Unite and GMB unions said the action was over a 10% pay cut imposed during the pandemic, which hadn't yet been reinstated. Our members, primarily low-paid, part-time women workers, have been asking nicely for over a year now to have this money paid back. This is money that was robbed from them during the pandemic. British Airways said it was disappointed and that despite heavy financial losses, it had offered a one-off 10% payment to other workers, most of whom had accepted. The airline added it was fully committed to working together to find a solution. <laughs> also today, Thousands of railway workers around Britain walked out for the second time this week. The main thing that we're looking for is no attack on our terms and conditions. We need a pay rise because the cost of living is so high now. Um, but the main thing is no attack. That We don't want compulsory redundancies and that's what the government is pushing for. About 20% of normal train services ran overall, finishing early, while some stations had no trains at all. Major hubs, including Glasgow, looked quiet as passengers heeded the warning to avoid rail travel. Many commuters switched back to working from home. That wasn't an option for Kamala, who can't get to her part-time job, teaching English as a foreign language in Bath. I'm on a zero of a contract, so I'm only paid for contact hours. If I can't get to work, I won't have the income to face all the extra energy bills, etc. So I do need to get to work. Some businesses, like this hotel near Milton Keynes, say they've also taken a hit. Monday and Tuesday were quiet because of obviously the Tuesday strike. Wednesday was being quite good, Thursday's been quiet. Um, we're down to 20% occupancy on those days. So how much do you think this week's cost you? Possibly £10,000. The rail industry says ways of working must be modernised, freeing up cash for a higher pay offer, and they hope compulsory redundancies can be avoided. But the RMT union wants them ruled out. 
Meanwhile, the government has announced plans are underway to change the law so employers can use agency staff to cover staffing gaps during strikes. The business secretary insisted this would be safe. The employers will always have to maintain the highest safety standards. There's no question of them lowering standards, bringing in agency workers. All we're doing is creating more flexibility. But opposition parties and unions have criticised the plan, arguing it would undermine pay and working conditions. A third day of strike action is planned for Saturday, and while there have been further talks today between the two sides in this dispute, there's still no sign of a deal. The RMT has warned more strikes are likely if an agreement isn't reached. Katie Austin, BBC News. Ukraine and Moldova have been approved as candidates for EU membership. Both countries applied to join after Russia invaded Ukraine. The process can take years. Well, our Europe editor Katya Adler is in Brussels and President Zelensky has called it an historic moment. How significant is it? Well, you know, Sophie, it is a question of perspective. For President Zelensky, he's been pushing for this moment he calls historic for a very long time because it allows him to turn around to Russia and say, look, we Ukraine, we belong in Europe, we belong in the West, not in your Russian sphere of influence. So he wanted this symbolism tonight. Tomorrow, of course, he'll be reminding the West that he also really needs that military and economic aid. For Russia's perspective, it's actually hardening its stance on Ukraine joining the EU. And why? Well, it says Brussels is taking a much more active role these days in defence. And as for the EU itself, well, leaders in there were really sincere in wanting to show solidarity tonight with war-torn Ukraine. But at the same time, questions are being asked as to whether their bloc can afford to take on new members. It's already got 27, Sophie, and they're so dramatically different, they often can't find agreement on difficult issues like migration or Russia sanctions. So add more voices to the mix, Ukraine, Moldova or countries from the Western Balkans. And some here are wondering, will that end up paralyzing the EU from the inside? Katia Adler in Brussels, thank you. The Independent Office for Police Conduct is to reinvestigate Metropolitan Police detectives who failed to spot that there was a serial killer operating in East London. Stephen Port murdered four men in the space of 16 months, but until now no police officer has faced a misconduct hearing. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford is with me now. Daniel. Thanks, Sophie. Three of Stephen Port's victims were found on the edge of this graveyard in Barking. One was found outside his front door nearby. It's now eight years since he killed his first victim, Anthony Walgate. Over the next 16 months, he also murdered Gabriel Cavari, Daniel Whitworth and Jack Taylor. But still their families feel no one's been held accountable for the police failures that left Port free to kill. So they only gave today's news a cautious welcome. Of course we're happy that it's getting reopened, um, but at the same time we're, we're obviously still really upset because it, it shouldn't have needed to be reopened because this shouldn't have happened in the first place. The findings were clearly wrong. We want justice. We feel like we don't have justice for Jack. And it's quite disgusting that even now, near enough seven years on, we're still having to fight. Um, we fought from the beginning and we feel like nobody stood up and been held accountable at all. Detectives spoke to Stephen Port within hours of the first death and he lied to them about Anthony Walgate being in his flat. The police prosecuted him for lying but didn't investigate him for murder until after the fourth death. It was the start of a catalogue of mistakes that were detailed at the men's inquest last year, including a fake suicide note that was not checked properly and a computer full of evidence that wasn't examined. Some officers simply didn't carry out the roles assigned to them. The family liaison officer for my friend Gabriel Cavari didn't contact his family once, didn't ring them, didn't email them. And it makes me feel a bit ill to say that because that lack of respect, you know, officers just simply not doing the job that they've been assigned to do. The jury at the inquest said there were fundamental failings in these investigations from the beginning. The police watchdog, the IOPC, started looking at the case in 2015. It investigated 17 officers, 16 of whom just said no comment in interviews. In 2019, it said, no police officer would face a misconduct or gross misconduct hearing. But because of what emerged at the inquests, where the officers did give evidence, it has today reopened its investigation. It's given the families some hope that some of the detectives, many of whom have been promoted, might finally 
be held to account. Sophie. Daniel, thank you. The Prime Minister has arrived in East Africa ahead of the Commonwealth Leaders Summit, which begins in Rwanda tomorrow. Boris Johnson has been defending his controversial asylum deal with Rwanda while touring the capital Kigali, telling critics to keep an open mind on it. On Friday, the Prime Minister is due to hold a meeting with Prince Charles, who's attending the gathering on behalf of the Queen. The US Supreme Court has upheld the right of Americans to carry guns in public, striking down century-old restrictions in New York that limited the ability of people to carry weapons openly. The decision could have ramifications for other states with similar regulations and is expected to allow more people to carry guns legally. Our North America editor Sarah Smith reports. The constitutional right to bear arms is dearly held in the United States. But exactly what that means in practice is deeply controversial. Today, the Supreme Court ruled that individual states cannot force people to have a permit to carry guns in public. The president, myself, many of us are deeply concerned and troubled by the Supreme Court's ruling today. Um, it, it, I believe, defies common sense and um, the Constitution of the United States. Don't shoot! I want to grow up! Street protests and public opinion have been demanding tougher action on gun control after recent mass shootings. But New York State will now have to make it easier to carry guns on the streets. We can say with certainty uh, this decision has made every single one of us less safe from gun violence. Cut. That's a wrap. Many Republican politicians proudly glorify gun ownership, insisting it is their right granted to them under the Constitution's Second Amendment. This means your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms shall not be denied by an unelected bureaucrat. As the Supreme Court makes it easier to carry guns, Congress is about to make it slightly harder to buy one. Democrats and Republicans have now agreed some limited gun control measures, including expanded background checks for prospective buyers who are under 21. Now, this doesn't go nearly as far as the Democrats, including President Biden, wanted. But it will be the first gun control legislation passed here in nearly 30 years, in a country that now has more guns in it than it has people. Sarah Smith, BBC News, Washington. Now, voting has just ended in two key by-elections for the Conservative Party in West Yorkshire and in Devon. It's the first test of voters' opinions since the Partygate scandal and the Prime Minister's confidence vote. In Wakefield, the Conservatives are defending a majority of just over 3,000. In Tiverton and Honiton, the Tories have a much larger majority of more than 24,000. Well, our political correspondent Nick Early is in Honiton for us tonight and our political correspondent Ian Watson is in Wakefield. Um, Ian, let's start with you. Labour is uh, hoping to win Wakefield back. What's the mood tonight? That's right, Sophie. Just for context, Wakefield has been Labour since 1932, apart from in 2019 when the so-called red wall of leave voting Labour seats crumbled to the Conservatives. So for Sir Keir Starmer, it's a big test as to whether he can win back that lost support. For Boris Johnson, it's a signal as to whether he's persuaded people to change their political views permanently or whether they simply lent that vote to get Brexit done. Now, Labour tonight are confident of victory. The Conservatives are insisting it's going to be close, but against the backdrop of a cost of living crisis and the fact that the previous Conservative MP here is now in prison, the scale of any Labour victory will be absolutely crucial. Can they, for example, get at least the 50% of the vote share they achieved the last time they held this seat in 2017? Can they also finish well ahead of the Conservatives? And can they prove that they're winning new support rather than simply making up lost ground? And Nick Early in Honiton, the Liberal Democrats are after that seat. That's a huge majority they've got to overturn, though. Sophie, this should be a safe Conservative seat. The party won Tiverton and Honiton by more than 24,000 votes just three years ago. But there is a possibility they, they will lose tonight to the Liberal Democrats. The Lib Dems have thrown the kitchen sink at this constituency in the past few weeks. They've been growing in optimism that they could pull off what would be a pretty remarkable victory. Tory sources are saying tonight that they're expecting a difficult night. The Lib Dems aren't declaring victory just yet, saying is very, very tight. But if the Conservatives lose, 
It would be the biggest ever majority to be lost at a by-election. It would be the third time that they've lost a comfortable majority to the Liberal Democrats in this Parliament. It would mean many Tory MPs looking over their shoulders, nervous about a forthcoming general election. It may well lead to some questioning the Prime Minister's future too. Boris Johnson said tonight the idea he might resign over these by-elections is crazy. Nick Eardley and Ian Watson, thank you both. And the results of those by-elections are expected in the early hours of the morning between 4 and 6 a.m. And you can follow them on the BBC News website or there will be coverage on the BBC News Channel. Now, the waiting list for hospital treatment in Wales has grown to a new record for the 24th month in a row. The latest figures from April show there were more than 700,000 patients waiting for treatment, which is approximately one in five of the population in Wales. Nearly 70,000 people have been waiting more than two years for treatment, even though this waiting time is starting to go down. The government says services are still recovering from the pandemic. Our correspondent Hal Griffith reports. I know, babe, sorry. <laughs> Raw, relentless pain. Whenever Marie moves, that's what she and her mother have to deal with. After four years of waiting for a new hip, they've had to resort to using morphine patches. Marie used to be mobile and loved to dance. Her learning disabilities mean she can't understand what's happening to her and why she's waiting so long. Seeing her in so much pain every single day, it's not fair. It depresses you, you know, because you can see she's in pain. She's gone crying every night when she goes to bed, screaming in pain. You know, how would you, anybody would like to see somebody screaming in pain every day. This is where Marie's family want her, need her to be receiving orthopaedic surgery. But the backlog is enormous. And it's not all down to the pandemic. There were already deep-rooted problems with long lists and a lack of capacity. Patricia has also waited four years for her surgery, a joint replacement in her thumb. She's relieved her op has finally come. It was very difficult, but Covid came in the middle and there wasn't anything you could do and I just accepted it. It's, it's nothing you can do about it. You just have to get on with it, don't you? Long waits are something patients in Wales have had to accept. One in three has been waiting over nine months for treatment. One in ten, more than two years. Seeing patients' health deteriorate is difficult for surgeons like Dougie Russell. It's heartbreaking seeing some of the patients, certainly. Their outcome may be poorer because they've had to wait longer, they've deconditioned on the waiting list. It's really frustrating. Before COVID, we recognised that particularly in Wales, we had a longer waiting list than a lot of our colleagues in England. Uh, and since the COVID pandemic has, has stopped much of our elective operating, particularly in orthopaedics, uh, our waiting list have been going up and up. The biggest problem is a lack of capacity. New theatres like this one in Swansea have been built. More are on the way. Staff need to be recruited before they can have an impact. The Welsh Government insists its plan is working. But for Marie and her mum... I know you're in pain, babes. Change can't come soon enough. Howell Griffith, BBC News. Parents are being urged to ensure their children's polio vaccines are up to date after the virus was found circulating in London during tests on sewage. Public health officials say the virus detected has the potential to spread, but the current risk level is low. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, is here, Fergus. Yes, Sophie, polio is a viral disease which can affect the spinal cord, causing muscle weakness and paralysis. But the risk is only to those who are not fully vaccinated, especially children. There used to be thousands of polio cases every year until vaccination was introduced in the mid-50s. And there hasn't been a case of wild polio acquired in the UK since 1984. The alert's been raised now because sewage monitoring has shown the virus is circulating somewhere in northeast London. Now, this is what's known as vaccine-derived polio virus. It's been brought into the UK by someone immunised abroad with oral polio vaccine drops. This contains weakened live virus, which can pass through the gut and potentially infect others through contaminated food or water. But no case of polio has yet been identified. 
the NHS now uses an injectable inactivated polio vaccine, which is highly protective. You get five doses as a child, first at 8, 12 and 16 weeks old. Now, that's part of a jab which protects against six serious diseases, including tetanus and whooping cough. Then polio boosters at age 3 and 14. But figures show that in England, almost one in six children had not had their preschool booster by the age of five. And that rises to one in four children in London. Now, that's a concern because polio can be spread by those who are infected but may not have any symptoms. Sophie. Fergus, thank you. And finally, listen to this. That was the Simon Bolivar Orchestra in a concert in Stirling ten years ago. And playing among them were children from one of Scotland's most deprived estates, the Raploch Estate in the city. It was all about trying to change lives by immersing children in music. A decade later, our arts correspondent David Sillitoe has been finding out what effect it all had on some of those children. Stirling 2012 and a moment. I remember one of the most special moments in my life. Gustavo Dudamel, the Simon Bolivar Orchestra, and the children of the Raploch Estate. It was a, a really a very special and unique moment. But this was more than just a concert, it was part of an experiment. Could music change lives? And so, ten years on, we've been finding out what's happened to the children. For instance, Lewis here on oboe. He's now at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. I think it was a major turning point. It wasn't until like, around the time of that concert, I was like, oh no, you can actually do this as a job. And violinist Luke has just completed a degree in music. Changed your life? Absolutely life-changing, yes. What would have happened, do you think, without music? That's a great question. Um, to, to answer to that question, I am not sure. Um, that's a very hard question. And this little girl with the trombone... <laughs> ..is Simone Hutchison, now entering her third year at the Royal Conservatoire. So this is where it all took place? Yeah. Over there? It's right there. Did it change things for you? 100%, yeah, 100%. I've been, I was totally inspired. And it's not just Simone, as you can see, Raploch now has its own symphony orchestra. <laughs> Gustavo Dudamel was himself a product of a similar scheme, and ten years on, we showed him what had become of the children. Say a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart. Wow, this is amazing. One visit, one encounter. Wow. No one's pretending the estate still doesn't have its struggles, but these days, it's better known for its music. People like Ben here on tuba. I, I love every minute of it. I love it. I, I love it all. And Imogen and family. It has changed the rap. It doesn't matter what they do, really. I'm always proud. Before big noise, researchers say they found one child learning an instrument. There are now more than 400. <laughs> David Soletto, BBC News, The Raploch, Stirling. Wonderful. Let's have a look at the weather now. Helen Willits is here with some beautiful colours. Was that taken today? Where was it? It was up in Yorkshire, home Firth. Isn't it beautiful? Just to illustrate, this is where we had some of the highest temperatures today, 28 degrees, and also close to my hometown in Harden in North Wales. But look wow. at this stunning one this evening of the sunset in the borders of Scotland. 
Well, not only the sun disappeared now, but also the sky across the borders of Scotland, because here we have it on the radar picture. These are heavy showers pushing north, and some of them have been thundery. That continues as we go through the rest of the night. Always more cloud out towards the west, but also now some sea fog creeping into the east coast of Scotland. One thing it will be tonight is warmer than last night. We had single figures last night, so a warm start to our Friday morning, perhaps a little bit grey with some fog in the east as well. And then out west, we've got low pressure. I draw your attention to this because it's with us for a few days. So we start with some sunshine, but the showers develop. They could turn heavy with thunder as well. And then out towards the west, some more persistent rain comes in across Northern Ireland through the afternoon into the west of Wales and the southwest of England. It's a little bit fresher, and we will notice that across Northern England and the northeast of Wales, 23, 24, still hanging on to 25, 26 across the Far East with some of the best of the sunshine. Then through the evening and overnight, that band of rain pushes its way further northwards, joining forces with another system stuck over the Northern Isles. And that low pressure is just with us then as we go into Saturday as well, throwing in more showers, longer spells of rain, more frequent set definitely in the west. But we could also have some showers creeping into eastern areas later on Saturday. But you can see by Saturday, it's fresher. The breeze is increasing tomorrow, another notch up on Saturday and Sunday. And unusually so for the time of year. So feeling fresher and quite showery for most of us and that pattern continues not just through Sunday but into Monday as well it looks as if they'll be most prevalent in the west those showers but as I say nowhere exempt but equally there'll be some good spells of dry weather as well at times Sophie. Helen thank you very much and that's it from us but don't forget you can follow the results of today's by-elections on the BBC News Channel and on the BBC website Newsnight with Mark Urban is just getting underway there he is on bbc2 and the news continues here on bbc1 we can t join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are from the 10 team it's good night <laughs>